The weather's much better than that today, isn't it? Nice. Yesterday was a great day, weather-wise. We're glad for that. So I know there's a few of you, one or two, that were probably unable to be here in the last week or two due to some of the weather conditions. Uh, so I need to remind you that we started a, a little while ago doing a series on uh, the Christian life. And uh, so far we've looked at things like totally committing ourselves to God, and that's obviously the foundation, and we'll keep coming back to that always, but we also um, talked a little bit about the sanctity of the home, and um, the last, last week we, we talked about um, just some of the big things of conflict in the world, and um, positions on war, and, and just individual things with people outside the church. And today we're going to take a look at um, how Christians are to relate with each other uh, in the body of Christ. And so we're going to look at Christian conflict. So obviously it's going to be a really short sermon, because that just never happens. No one ever has a conflict with each other, right? Unfortunately, um, I don't think that's true. And... A lot of times when we have conflict, if you want it to really be short, I could maybe summarize things like this and say, well, if we have conflict in the body of Christ, either deal with it or forget about it. <laughs> maybe that's the best way to say it. We either work together, get it right, uh, or we just forget about things. I think the issues today, sometimes maybe it's because of our communication skills or lack thereof, but sometimes issues today just seem to be bigger than they used to be. Maybe I'm just old. But the Word of God is still true. It's eternally true. Uh, God is eternally relevant. It does not matter when you lived, if you lived a thousand years ago, or if you live today, God is always relevant to you at that time, at that moment, and that day. Always. Always relevant. So His Word's really important to us to look at and to see um, how to handle things. Now, I hope that uh, we will never experience, at least here or anywhere, Christians who are in such conflict with each other that it resorts to some level of violence. Uh, I'm also um, aware enough to know that it has happened sometimes in the past, even sometimes here, but not any time in recent decades. So we're glad for that. But I'm going to show you a couple passages of Scripture that um, perhaps will be a neat guideline for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul's writing to a bunch of believers in a town. Um, I like to say this is at the first carnal church of Corinth um, because some of them were a little bit immature in their faith. And that's a, that's a genuine thing, but it can also be a bad thing. Here's some of these verses. I'm going to read the first eight verses. If any of you has a dispute with another, then um, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, you are not competent to judge trivial cases. Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have completely defeated, been defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong. And you do this to your brothers. That may have sounded a little unusual to you because we need some context. So it's the first church, the first carnal church of Corinth, and they had a big carrying dinner that day. And when they went out into the parking lot, two of the chariots backed into each other. And they each knew that they had the right of way. And they fought over this verbally and finally decided to go down to the municipal court 
and settle the issue. Well, I don't, that wasn't the real story, honest. Uh, I don't think that's what happened, but it's similar to what happened. There was some kind of wrong done by one believer to the other believer, and it involves property. Um, this, by the way, does not include the area of criminal behavior. Uh, if, if someone uh, murders somebody else in, in communion service, um, we're probably not going to be able to take that before the elders. We're going to probably have to bring in some of the other legal people as well. So, <clears throat> this is involving some conflict uh, against each other. It's Christians who are in conflict against each other. And there's a couple reasons why, you know, I ask the question, how does this happen? How do Christians have problems with each other? That's ridiculous. You know, we love each other. We're, we're part of the body of Christ. We have every reason to be optimistic, happy, good, loving people. And yet, things happen. Well, it happens partially because of sin and selfishness. I really tried to make that one word, and I had it all different combinations, and Spellcheck was getting angry at me. So, so I just put a hyphen in there. But uh, because you and I sin, we do. And because we can tend to be selfish. And, and I always know that my side's always right. I have a Bible verse to prove everything. And um, so, you know, those kind of things can cause conflicts among other people, uh, other believers who also have a Bible verse that proves that they're right as well. And, and so, um, you know, the color of the carpet can become major because we own things and, and are possessive of it. The other area, too, which I like to think is even bigger yet, is because we're living in enemy territory. Um, this world still is under the power and influence of Satan, and uh, he has influence on us. And he knows what buttons to push, and he knows how to get you and I to react and respond and, and do the wrong things at times. So no matter why it happens, Conflict does happen. And again, I'll go back and say either we deal with it or we forget about it and live to act as if it never happened before. In this passage, there's a couple interesting things that come up. It tells us that, um, don't we know that believers, well, I'll go back to that, believers um, will make judgments at some time. Very, very interesting. It says that we're going to judge the world and then we're going to judge angels. And I don't know all the answers to what all that means and, and how that works out. Uh, I have my own theories. Here's something that Jesus said, uh, at least to the disciples. Uh, he might have been just thinking of them, or he might have been thinking of them as representing all of us. But Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. At the renewal of all things, and I think that's probably the very end of, of uh, this modern era, when Christ comes back and, and judges, and then we go into a kingdom period, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, Son of Man is Jesus, uh, you, have, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That I don't have a whole lot of idea of how that's going to work out. But I do know that... Um, Paul said here that, do you not know you're going to judge the world? The saints are going to judge the world. Here's one of my theories on how we judge the world. Um, at the very, very end of everything, after the millennium came, after Christ has established his kingdom, after Satan's rebelled and all those things happen, there's at the very end of uh, this time as you know it, um, there's what's called the great white throne judgment, Revelation 20. And at that judgment, people who have not obeyed, followed, responded to Christ will be judged. Those who are going to be cast out and, and judged. And I wonder, I just wonder, this is not factual, biblical truth, but I wonder if maybe um, we're going to be aware of that at least. And are we going to be called up as witnesses? I don't know. Um, is it possible 
that Jesus may be judging an individual who's going to be cast into the lake of fire, into hell forever, and that person is going to say, it's not fair, I never heard, or whatever they're going to argue. <laughs> is it possible Jesus will turn to me and say, Bud, you knew that guy for five years. Did you ever tell him about, about me? I hope I say yes, but I may say no, I don't know. And then he might say, did you ever know him to accept me as his savior, to want me to be his Lord? I'm probably going to say no. I, I mean, everything about that judgment is going to be fair at that moment. I may be called upon, you may be called upon to give witness. I don't know. I don't know that. But somehow, some way in the future, you and I are going to probably place in a position where we make some kind of judgment about the things that have happened in this life. doesn't mean we're the final word. It's not like everything balances on us. But it substantiates the fairness, the justice of God, I think. And, um, and this is one passage that Jesus told him about related toward the millennial kingdom. It also says in there uh, that we're going to judge angels. Now again, I'm not sure exactly what that says. I, I put some references. I didn't want to take you on a lot of rabbit trails today. But 2 Peter 2.4 talks about judging angels. Jude verse 6 talks about judging angels. Um, you know, there's a, there's a theory that back in Genesis 6 that some angels, some of the fallen angels, the evil angels, had um, cohabitated with some of the women, uh, the human women at that time, and, uh, and that God was really upset about that, and there's certain judgment. Peter uses a word that's a unique one. I don't think we have an English word to translate it, but it's a word that um, tells about where these bad angels that God got tired of, where he's holding them for judgment. Uh, in the Greek, it's the word Tartarus, and so basically God tartarizes them. I don't know what that means in English, but um, he's holding them for a final judgment. How do you and I judge that? I don't know. But I wonder, too, um, are you going to... I believe that human beings have a guardian angel. I believe that. I'm, I'm not as squirrely as you see on some of the TV about that, but um, I think you have a guardian angel who has responsibility um, to be with you. So, you know, you stubbed your toe today. Are you going to be able to say to the angel, well, where were you? You know, there was a bedpost there. Why didn't you tell me? You know, and I don't know how we're going to judge the guardian angel or whoever we judge. I just know it's fact because God's word says it. I also know it's fact that it's wrong to take a dispute between brothers and go to a pagan justice system if we can avoid that. There are things in the body of Christ that should stay in the body of Christ because otherwise it becomes an embarrassment to the cause of Jesus Christ. Verses 7 and 8 says it brings defeat. And some of the reason that that happens is not because we want to see Jesus promoted or we want him honored and we think, wow, wouldn't it be a neat testimony in the court if we went to court and, and they could see how, how loving we are? Here, Paul says, it's because of your greed, it's because of vengeance that you're doing this, and that just really hurts the cause of Jesus. In fact, it is better for one of you to just say, I'm going to be wronged, King James says, I'll be defrauded. I will lose whatever I have to lose because I'm going to avoid embarrassing the name of Jesus. It's just I think that's an interesting concept. We're looking at that only because we're looking at the Christian life and how we get along with each other. And uh, I wanted to read to you from Matthew chapter 5 because this is just another area of things that come up legally. And Matthew 5 verses 33 through 37. Here's what Jesus said. Again, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, 
or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black, which we could. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. That's kind of an unusual thing, isn't it? You're not supposed to take oaths. Yesterday, Ann and I were at a meeting, and for fun, the guy who was a speaker uh, was really being silly. Um, it was a, a teacher-type thing. And he said, everybody's going to take an oath, raise your right hand. And then he, I'm glad he used the word front. I didn't raise my hand, I didn't do it. But, uh, and I was sitting right beside the speaker, so everybody knew that. But anyhow, um, he said, you know, promise that uh, you will not talk to any other teacher about what we're talking about because they don't know what they're talking about. And this guy does, that kind of thing. And it was silly and fun and everybody laughed and, and followed his instructions. That really wasn't one that counts, but uh, what God is saying here is he does not want you and I, basically when we swear by the name of God, we're asking God to leave his throne, to come down here, and to verify that what I'm saying is true. And I'm not so sure God wants to do that for every single incident that you and I are a part of. Or all those other things. I assume it means you're, you're really probably not supposed to swear on your grandmother's grave either or any of those kind of things that kids used to do when I was growing up. But anyhow, it's just one of those things. We're fortunate in our country that um, when it comes to legal things, that they allow Christians to be exempt from swearing that kind of an oath. And so... Um, we just basically say that we affirm that we will tell the truth because as Christians, everybody knows that Christians, when they say yes, they mean yes. And when they say no, they mean no. Or at least that's what your testimony and my testimony should be uh, when we approach these kind of things. Well, this is another passage I wanted to deal with you on in Matthew chapter 18. Um, take a look at some of those really personal things. This is the one you really want to zero in on because it's a little bit more practical when it comes to uh, Christians and conflicts and things along those lines. And I'm in Matthew 18 and I'm going to start at verse 15, I believe. It says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by the Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. Now, there's a lot of stuff there. But basically what we want to talk about is personal offenses and sin that takes place, conflict between brothers and sisters in Christ. And so here Jesus tells us a really valid process that has been used for 2,000 years uh, among the church of Jesus Christ and used effectively. Now to be honest with you, not every single situation that has ever been brought through this process has gone the way everybody wanted it to go. But again, if you remember that slide back a little bit before, it's because of sin and selfishness. It's because we're living in enemy territory that Satan will, will just sabotage the system. Um, we've had things here in our church, we've had to use this. There have been times when it's gone through the leadership part that most of the rest of the church knew nothing about. Uh, there's been a couple times where we've had to come things before the church and, and let you know. We have some success stories that are just really, really wonderful. I mean, I, I wish I could tell them all to you. And we've had a couple failures that have been heart-wrenching for us, and, and it's just really sad. Um, Jesus gave us uh, a process. The first thing is to approach. If someone sins against you, 
And in the King James, I think it says, and if, if there's an offense, that you're offended by something, that's probably closer to what you'll actually experience. But if somebody does something to you that is really hurtful and harmful, then believe it or not, it's your responsibility to go and tell them. To go to them and just say, hey, you know, I don't know what you meant by what you said, but that was really hurtful to me. That really hit me in the wrong way. What were you trying to do? What were you saying? Hopefully that person's going to say, oh, man, no. I didn't mean it that way at all. Uh, you know, and then you can help. I had a situation a little over a year ago where someone came to me about something I said to them 20 years prior to that and then hurt them. And I had no idea. And in fact, there were probably 100 people that were there and heard what I said, and 99 of them would have told you there was absolutely nothing there. Um, but that one person was really hurt by it. And when they said that to me, it's like, I never wanted to do that to you. I never intended to hurt you at all. I felt horrible about it. I think the worst part was that he spent 20 years beating himself up over something that was not intended and wasn't there at all. And, uh, and I hope that he's better from that, but um, it was just a, it was a tough thing. Don't let that stuff happen to you. Uh, you know, go and do it right. And, and if they said, well, you know what, the truth is, you are that way, and I meant to say it that way because you are that way, whatever it is. If that's what they say, and you're hurt, and, and they don't want to deal with it, if you want, take you know, some Christian godly counsel friends with you and, and take some witnesses and go and talk to them again. And perhaps these witnesses will be able to say, now, wait a minute, uh, Horatio, you really need to have a little more of a sensitive spirit here and, and, um, and deal with this. The idea of taking two witnesses was well established in the Old Testament. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, one witness is not enough to convict a man accused of any crime or offense he may have committed. Uh, you need to have multiple witnesses, only because, again, sin and selfishness and Satan, we may, um, you know, I may want to make this person really suffer, and uh, we need more than just one witness. And a matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Does God do that? Does God do that? How many people I witnessed physically touched and handled Jesus, the resurrected Savior? I'm, I'm going to say, we don't know that for sure, but I'm going to say it's not far off to say upwards of a thousand people. I think God shattered the two or three witness rule by saying, I'm going to have upwards of a thousand people see Jesus, touch Jesus, talk to him, so that everybody will know beyond a shadow of a doubt, Jesus Christ is alive and, and living. But he tells us, two or three witnesses, you know, get godly people to help you in, uh, in this uh, conflict. And if that doesn't work, and if Horatio still says, you know, I don't care what you tell me, I don't care who you are, you could be the pastor, you could be the elder, you could be the, the Sunday school teacher, I don't care. I'm not listening to you. I still think he's what I said he is. And if you want to, if it merits it, then you can uh, take it to the church. Take it before the body of Christ. And they should try to, to help. And um, you can read in 1 Corinthians, there's examples of that going on. Actually, in chapter 5, by the way, in chapter 5, they bypassed some of this stuff. And the reason why they bypassed it was because it was obvious immoral sin. And they just went straight to either repent or you're out. And the guy didn't repent, so he was placed out. And that's where you bring in church discipline. That's all part of stuff that can happen if we let things get out of hand in our personal relationships. By the way, when it comes to leadership in a church... Paul wrote to Timothy and said this, Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it's brought by two or three witnesses. Those who sin are to be rebuked publicly so that the others may take warning. 
So if someone were to come to us and say, I think we really need to do something about that Dave Jensen. I know he's an elder in the church, but man, is he a spiritual pygmy. Uh, he doesn't even have a tie on today. And it's like, really? And, and so, so let's do it. Let's vote him out. And it's like, well, you know, I think, uh, well, prior to that, in 1 Timothy 5, there's a list of instructions and restrictions about elders. Uh, and I think that the complaint should not be about a tie, but should be biblically based. There should be some reason, not something frivolous. Uh, but it's also important to remember, too, that church leaders are held to a higher standard than just everyone. Actually, I think everybody should be held to a higher standard, and no one should be exempt. I haven't seen a verse yet that says elders are to be spiritual and godly, but everybody else can slip and slide if they want. <laughs> I haven't seen that verse yet. But anyhow, elders and church leaders are held to a higher standard. Um, but I, I also know for a fact that that's not true in all churches today. Uh, not everybody follows scripture in trying to, um, to staff their leadership positions. So in that Matthew 18 situation, if the offending person, the person who offended the other ones, does not repent, then needs to be disciplined um, by the church. But the end goal is always restoration. That's in red, and I think it's underlined. Uh, the end goal is always restoration. Conflict between believers, the end goal is always restoration. That means the process should always be bathed in prayer and executed with love. Always. Even if somebody is hard-hearted and they're not going to change and they're not going to repent, we still keep praying for them, we keep loving them as much as possible. The relationship between brothers in Christ is to be one of grace, unity, and love. Jesus told us in John 13 that we're to be different, distinct. We are to love one another. That it was a new commandment. Well, they, we were always supposed to. You mean for the first 4,000 years people didn't have to love each other? They always were supposed to love each other. But it's new because in the body of Christ, this is the thing that's going to mark us out as different than the rest of the world. So much so that people are going to look and say, man, they have such love for each other. There's something different about them. We need this. I want what they have. You know, back in the early days of the church, sometimes um, people would have babies and Believe it or not, sometimes girls were not as favored as boys. And so your average Joe Pagan and his wife would have a baby, and they're struggling anyhow. And here it is, it's a baby girl. We don't need another mouth to feed. She's not worth anything to our family good. So out on the street she would go. And there's lots and lots of stories of Christians going up and down the streets and picking up babies and taking them in and taking care of them and loving them and raising them. It's a pretty neat thing. We have today what they, a process we call adoption. And uh, Ron and Jeannie, I think, are getting a brand new grandson today. So through that process. So you can greet them and give them a shout out for that. That's pretty cool. So, you know, Christians just do things that make us distinct and different. Um, by the way, you and I are to be the answer to Christ's prayer. <laughs> and you can do that. You really can. What prayer is that? John 17, it says this. Jesus, in the middle of that prayer, says, My prayer is not for them alone. He had just been praying about the disciples and what they were going to face and the, and the persecution and stuff. And he said, and, and he's praying to God, and it's the night before he's going to be crucified, and he's praying for his disciples. But then he also, I think, prays for you and I, where he says, I'm not praying for them alone. But I pray for those who will believe in me through their message. You are a follower of Jesus because of the message of the apostles and the disciples of Jesus who were there with him, and, and I witnessed this, and they shared it, and they wrote it down, and it's come through the centuries, one after another, so that you and I today have faithful testimony of what God wants us to know, 
and we have the proof that Jesus Christ is the risen Savior. And he's praying for us that all of them may be one, that we can all be united in one. And he says, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. What's the Christian relationship for? Jesus is praying that your relationship with other believers in the body of Christ is so tight that it's just like the Creator God and the Creator Jesus and the Creator Holy Spirit. That is a tri-unity that is a, a model for how we should love and, and be together. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The church is different. We're not the world. We are different. And that's a great thing to be, by the way. So we reach out, uh, living before this world. You demonstrate how committed you are to your belief in Jesus Christ every single day by the way that you live out his commands in your life. Your level of obedience is a reflection of your commitment. It reflects how seriously you think that Jesus is God. Do people look at you and your life and say, wow, he really believes in Jesus. He lives so much like Jesus really is who he says he is. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you with our hearts wide open, knowing that sometimes, sometimes the relationship between uh, brothers and sisters in Christ is sometimes the hardest relationship to, to live out. Maybe it's because we're closer to each other, we know more about each other, we see each other's uh, blemishes. And yet, God, you love us in spite of who we are. You died for us to save us from who we are. And you ask us to, to love and, and to show your grace to everyone around us. God, give us the strength, give us the ability today and the days to come to live as though you were right there with us, um, to show that we believe and obey you enough uh, that people would be uh, well aware that we are your followers. And we ask that, Lord, so that Jesus Christ would be promoted around the world and that he would be lifted up in our hearts and in all of his glory. In Christ's name, amen.